The first item of business today is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is rural economy. I would remind members that questions two and four will be grouped together today and come to question number one, John Scott. Officer, I'm declaring an interest to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on encouraging behavioural change with regard to food production in light of evidence received by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee from the, climate, the Committee on Climate Change. Marie Goujon. Scotland is world-renowned for the quality and the provenance of its food and we want farmers and food producers to work with us to produce more of it sustainably. Uh, we are supporting behavioural change and shifts to low-carbon farming practices through a range of activity including the Farm Advisory Service, the Beef Efficiency Scheme and QMS's Monitor Farm Programme. John Thank Scott. You. I thank the Minister for her answer and she will be aware of the Climate Change Committee advice on the need to reduce red meat consumption significantly to meet future targets. Is the Scottish Government of the view that this is necessary or does the Scottish Government and the Minister support my view that the access to a balanced diet should include sufficient red meat consumption and that this should be a matter of individual choice, particularly as most of the red meat production in Scotland is grass fed? Marie Goujon. Uh, I thank the member for that question and yes I'm, I, and I'm aware that the Environment Committee took evidence from the, the Climate Change Committee uh, as well this week um, but we really want to continue to lead in promoting behavioural change towards low carbon farming and uh, as I mentioned in my first answer to John Scott we've done that through the establishment of the beef efficiency scheme and our support for the agri-environment schemes by ensuring that high quality advice information and on-farm demonstrations are available through the farm advisory service and farming for a better climate and of course I do think there's a, a, we want to work with farmers and to do that I said that in the, the statement yesterday and in know that the Cabinet Secretary for the Envi Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform feels the same. Um, but this is, we're in a climate emergency and this is an issue that we have to, to, to try and tackle together. But that's why we have a number in of initiatives here. Uh, and we also have our climate change champions who are hoping to lead by example and to show how we can still have uh, livestock farming and how that can still contribute to, to what we're aiming to do in this climate emergency. Supplementary, Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In order to change practice, farmers and crofters need advice and information, but they also need financial support. Can I ask what measures will be in the new agricultural support scheme to help farmers and crofters make the required change in practice? Marie Goujon. Sorry. Um, I would say that, I mean, I've as I've already highlighted, we have a number of schemes already available at the moment where we are investing in that change. And that's something that we will have to continue to do. I think research and innovation is going to be absolutely vital as we move forward and as we try and work with farmers and crofters to see how we can tackle the climate emergency together. Uh, as I mentioned in my previous response to, to John Scott, we have the, the climate change champions, uh, the farming for a better climate as well, where we're looking at soil regeneration. So these are uh, there are a whole number of schemes that the government is currently providing funding for and uh, when it comes to that research and innovation moving forward that is something that which will of course become a, a vital part of support as we move forward questions two and four will be grouped together question number two james kelly thank you deputy presiding officer to ask the scottish government what action it is taking to promote the food and drink sector in canvas lang Marie Goujon. Direct investment and support from the public sector, which helps promote the food and drink sector in Scotland, equates to approximately £100 million per annum across a range of areas, including skills, education, research, industry development, standards and capital investment. This funding is provided on a national basis and would be available to any ba business based in Canvas Lang. James Kelly. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will be aware that the Two Sisters Chicken Processing Plant in Canvas Lang closed last year. This was despite the payment of £650,000 in regional selective assistance to Two Sisters on the basis of keeping the plant open. Uh, this money is now in the process of being repaid, but the Scottish Government have confirmed to me that it will be recycled for general economic activity and not invested in Canvas Lang despite an assurance from the First Minister in November that Canvas Lang would be involved in consultation of how that money is spent. 
Can I therefore ask the Minister if she agrees that, that uh, the money, this money being repaid should be invested in Cambus Lang and that the Government will urgently review its decision on this? Mary Cushion. I would say that contrary to Mr Kelly's comments, the Scottish Government's position on this has been clear and the position uh, and the commitment in that sense hasn't changed. Now, the First Minister previously had explained in the Chamber that the process that Scottish Enterprise would embark on to obtain repayment of any monies paid to two sisters in relation to the site of Cambus Lang. And that process has been undertaken and a repayment plan has now been agreed with two sisters to return the monies in full. And I know that that was explained to Mr Kelly in a recent letter from my ministerial colleague, Amy Hepburn and the First Minister also said in this chamber that we would in due course have discussions with the local community about future investment and I know that since then Scottish Enterprise has been in discussion with South Larnetshire Council on the actions needed to boost economic growth in the area and how they might be reflected in the Council's refreshed economic strategy which is supported by the £500 million Scottish Government commitment in the Glasgow City Region deal and I know that further discussions are planned on the 13th of June and at that meeting there will be a discussion to identify the key economic challenges across the authority area aligning with the Glasgow city region plan and particularly around the five city region deal projects that are relevant to South Lanarkshire um, which of course we're fully committed to and where there are suitable projects both in the Cambus Lang area and wider area. Question number four Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports the food and drink sector in Glasgow. Glasgow is home to a wide range of food and drink companies and plays a key role in our food and drink success story. Since 2012, four companies have been supported with £2.31 million in food processing, marketing and cooperation grants, including McQueen's Dairy, who I believe are based within the members' constituency. Bob Doris. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I thank the Minister for, for that answer. Can I draw the Minister's attention to the company The Vegan Kind, who are a hugely successful vegan retailer, including foods uh, based in Mary Hill, and they use an online platform for their sales. I understand their growing success is boosting demand for vegan foods and creating new opportunities for vegan food producers, including here in Scotland. Can I ask uh, how the Scottish Government might consider supporting innovative models of food retail, such as at the Vegan Kind in Mary Hill, given the boost that their success can offer both vegan food producers here in Scotland and indeed offer additional accessible convenient dietary choice to families. Mary Cushon. I would say that the growing vegan market does still offer opportunities for Scottish food producers and businesses to develop the produce using our natural larder here in Scotland. And I know that Scotland Food and Drink are supporting food and drink producers to capitalise on that growing demand. And there's another company, Delicious, I, I would say are another good example of that, because they, are, they produce fresh convenience food using quality, locally sourced Scottish produce to help with those with special dietary requirements <laughs> And having started in the free from market, they've now developed a successful vegan range. And while I know some adhere to a strictly vegan diet uh, for a variety of reasons, I'm keen that we continue to promote healthy, locally sourced Scottish produce and produce grown and made here, which supports jobs here, supports livelihoods, and um, most importantly as well, helps to reduce food miles. Supplementary, John Mason. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if the Minister would agree with me that uh, the biggest threat to the food and drink sector in Cambus Lang and beyond is Brexit, and it would help quite a lot if Mr Kelly and his chums were to come off the fence and oppose Brexit. Mary Cuccio. Probably won't surprise the member that I agree very much with him in that statement because we've been clear from day one that leaving the EU, specifically without a deal, would have an absolutely catastrophic impact on the food and drink sector. And it's expected to cost us about £2 billion, and that's from the UK government's own figures. And that impact would be felt whether that's on our exports, our PGI status for some of our most important products, uh, and the free movement of people too. And I talked about the, the, some of the other impacts on our sheep sector in the statement that I made to this parliament yesterday. Now, this Scottish government has always asserted that the best future for Scotland is to remain in the EU and second best to that, to maintain as close an alignment to the EU as we possibly can. And I think it's high time that others started realising that too, if we're to avert the untold damage that we brought on, not just this sector, but our wider economy as a whole. Question number three, David Stewart. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it plans to take in light of the Scottish Affairs Committee's evidence session on seasonal agricultural workers. Fergus Ewing. Uh, President Officer, seasonal migrant workers have a vital contribution to farming and food production in Scotland. We share NFU Scotland's concerns about the availability of suitably skilled workers and the risk this pre presents to this year's crops and harvests. The UK Government's future migration proposals do not meet Scotland's needs. The evidence presented to the committee highlights serious issues with the pilot scheme which seeks to recruit 2,500 workers for the whole of the UK, not enough, presiding officer, to meet the needs, uh, the number of current vacancies in the horticulture sector in Angus alone. We will continue to monitor the situation and work across government to address skills and employment needs throughout the rural economy. But it is clear that one of the key solutions is to fully devolve immigration powers so that Scotland might develop a tailored migration policy actually to meet our needs. David Stewart. President officer, agricultural seasonal workers are often seen as low paid and low skilled, but all the evidence suggests that many of the jobs are actually highly skilled. Losing the workers will not only be a hard blow to employers and the local economy, but will have a significant knock-on effect in terms of depopulation of already fragile remote communities. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me mean supporting the workers from Europe and beyond will form a vital part of the backbone of rural Scotland, providing skilled labour and injecting a fresh breath of fresh air into our rural communities? Fergus Ewing. Yes, I'm very happy to agree with uh, what David Stewart has said. I'm very pleased that he's made those uh, remarks. Uh, uh, these workers uh, work extremely hard, uh, uh, certainly in the berry picking, the day starts very early and the conditions are tough, the work is hard and we really appreciate and welcome what they do and the contributions they make to the economy and society in rural Scotland and we, we think that they should continue to be uh, welcomed in Scotland uh, presiding officer. So that's why it's so important that freedom of movement should uh, continue to be the policy and I very much hope that that the Labour Party in Scotland will support freedom of movement because Mr Corbyn doesn't seem to. Supplementary from Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that it's scandalous that after three years after the Brexit vote and Tory inaction, farmers still don't have any certainty or clarity about their workforces? Fergus Ewing. Scandalous. I think he, he has put it... Uh, very clear. I mean, the Tories are laughing. I don't know why they're laughing. This is extremely serious. And just about every employer in the rural economy in Scotland has made the same point for three years now. Three years in which to find a solution to allow people from other countries who are working hard in rural communities and whose work is indispensable, a sine qua non of the rural economy functioning. And the Scottish Tories have said nothing about this for three years, presiding officer. It is an absolute scandal. Yeah. Mr. Lyle is quite right. Question number five has been withdrawn. Question number six, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with representatives of the fishing industry and what was discussed. Fergus Ewing. The Scottish Government met with the Clyde Fishmen's Association on the 11th of May uh, and meets regularly with representatives of the fishing industry. Ross Greer. I thank Minister for uh, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Enforcement of marine protected areas is already very difficult, which allows a small number of rogue fishing vessels to wreak havoc in protected habitats and undermines the fishing industry for everyone else. Last December, the Parliament voted to roll out electronic monitoring of fishing vessels across the whole fleet to ensure that enforcement can be effective. When does the government expect to be able to properly enforce marine protected areas by monitoring all fishing vessels? Fergus Ewing. Um, well, I'm delighted that the, the Scottish government is, uh, is investing £1.5 million, pounds, presiding officer, in fishing vessel tracking and monitoring. I myself had uh, an, an excellent and productive meeting with the stakeholders about precisely how this investment is made uh, to get best value and to be the most efficacious. And this is one of the most practical things which can be done to ensure that sustainable fishing takes place. Uh, and I'm determined that this be done as quickly as it can, but actually the real priority is to make sure that it is effective, that we have the right systems, uh, and of course there are, there are options available, and that's efficacious to secure the objective, which I think we share across this chamber, as Mr. Greer re referred to and alluded to in that debate. It's important that we get it right, but I can absolutely assure the member that there will be no feet dragging. 
Question number seven, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of the food and drink sector and what was discussed. Fergus Ewing. The Scottish Government meets with representatives from the vital food and drink industry on a regular and ongoing basis to discuss a range of issues. Uh, I'll also be attending the prestigious Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards next week in Edinburgh to meet with representatives from the sector and to celebrate the best that our successful industry has to offer. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Over recent months, I have met with a number of local businesses in my constituency, including the impressive family-run business Fife Creamery. They are just one of a growing number of companies who are become increasingly aware of their environmental responsibilities and the importance of phasing out single-use plastics in their packaging. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what support and guidelines exist for businesses who are keen to invest in the greener and more sustainable alternatives? Fergus Ewing. Uh, yes, Zero Waste Scotland's Food and Drink Advice and Support Service does provide audits uh, to businesses to help them reduce their food and drink waste. And it has an £18 million circular economy investment fund to support uh, investments in that matter. And uh, I'm indebted to my uh, hardworking, uh, energetic uh, colleague, uh, the Minister for Rural Affairs, Ms. Goujon, who has assured me that she's recently met the company uh, and that it does great work. And we're very keen to, to continue that work with them and with our agencies to ensure that the changes which are made in respect of this matter and the objectives that we all share are pursued in an effective and pragmatic fashion to help businesses such as this, who quite rightly want to do their bit by the environment, but want to do so in a way that is, that is sensible, well thought out, pragmatic and deliverable. Question number eight, Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether all outstanding agri-environment climate scheme claims from farm business businesses in the North East for the 217 claim year will be paid by the end of June 2019. Fair uh, Yes, that's our intention. The remaining cases from 2017 have been complex to process, with eligibility issues associated with each claim that staff are currently working to resolve. My officials assure me they're confident that all outstanding issues will be cleared over the next few weeks, allowing all remaining claims to be paid by 30th of June this year. Tom Mason. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I appreciate that this is not an instantaneous process and there are going to be some delays along the way. Given that the, Scottish, given that the total Scottish farm debt is currently around £2 billion, and almost half of our farmers are failing to make enough money to pay themselves the, the equivalent of the minimum wage. These resources are vitally important. What safeguards can the Cabinet Secretary put in place to make sure that such delays are lessened in subsequent years? Fergus uh, Well, I, I think Mr, Mr. Mason, Mason raises a, a, a perfectly fair, correct general point. And it's precisely because of that point that in Scotland, at my specific direction, working with the full cooperation of colleagues, including the Finance Minister, that farmers in Scotland last October, starting on the 5th of October, and crofters in Scotland received uh, effectively advanced payments, uh, in most cases of up to 90% of their full entitlement, starting from 5th of October. Uh, I think nearly 18,000 offers over £317 million from memory, presiding officer. That money was received in farmers and crofters' bank accounts around two months before any other farmers south of the border. Yes, so it's precisely because of the need to make sure that in these difficult times, facing the enormous uncertainties caused by Brexit, Mr. Mason's party's preferred policy, at least we think so anyway, they don't really say, that because of these difficulties, we have made sure that farmers and crofters get their money and actually get most of it earlier than the rest of the UK. And I want to keep it that way. Uh, a quick supplementary, please, from Maureen Mort. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary also confirm that the uh, payments for 2018 uh, are on time, on time? And can he also confirm that the Scottish Government wants to keep farmers farming in Scotland and producing food, contrary to what Mr Gove told us this morning? Fergus Ewing. Uh, well, we've made a strong start to the payment of the 218 ex claims. We've commenced 218 payments on the 29th of March. That's two months earlier than the 217. Over 47% of claims have now been paid worth £7.8 million. 
At the same point last year, we had not yet begun making payments. So I hope members will agree this is an excellent uh, progress. Uh, and I just finally pay tribute to all the hardworking staff in ARPID in offices throughout the country who are delivering uh, this work. They do a superb job. They're respected by the farming community. And I'm wholly indebted to them for their efforts. That concludes questions on the rural economy. And we'll move on to questions on transport, infrastructure and connectivity, please. Question number one, Liam MacArthur. Presiding officer, uh, to ask the Scottish Government when road equivalent tariff will be fully introduced on Orkney and Shetland ferry routes. Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government is engaging with the European Commission following a state aid complaint made to them by a private operator on the 8th of June 2018 regarding our plans to reduce ferry fares to the Northern Isles. Officials met with the Commission officials on the 12th of November and we await a formal view from the Commission regarding next steps. In June 2018, we reduced passenger and car fares on routes to Shetland by 20%, with this being possible to implement as it did not affect Orkney services. We remain committed to pursuing all avenues to reduce fares for Orkney and Shetland. Liam McCarthy. Can, can I thank the Minister for that response? Next month marks um, 12 months uh, since RET was supposed to be rolled out on ferry routes serving Orkney and Shetland. Over that time, those using those lifeline routes have been forced to continue paying over the odds. So will the Minister therefore commit to reinforcing the Commission the urgent need to conclude its investigation, reach a decision and allow those relying on those life ser uh, lifeline services a fair deal? And will he also commit to ensuring the monies not spent on RET over the past year are directed to supporting the internal ferry services within Orkney and Shetland? Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, on, the, on the first point that Liam MacArthur raises, uh, just to reassure him, we are continuing to engage, as I say, with the European Commission uh, regarding the state aid complaint made by the private operator. And uh, we have very recently uh, written in light of the uh, judgment made by uh, Lord Boyd of Duncan's Bay in relation to the judicial review uh, that was held in the court session. Uh, of course, the member will be aware there is now a, a potential appeal uh, to that decision, so I cannot comment further. But uh, just to reassure the member that we are continuing to engage with the Commission to urge for uh, as quick as possible resolution to the state aid's uh, complaint. On the second point that he raises, um, we have discussed the point uh, regarding the use of RET revenues um, or funding uh, allocated for RET for internal ferry service. That's something that was raised by Orkney Islands Council's leader, uh, Councillor Stockin, when I last met with him uh, recently uh, in, in Parliament. Orkney Islands Council have committed to taking the issue away to engage with local stakeholders, presumably, uh, presumably uh, Mr. MacArthur and other local elected members, to further discuss this issue and I remain open to holding further discussions with the Council on the issue. Supplementary from Donald Cameron and then Rhoda Grant. Donald Cameron. On the subject of RET, the Minister will be aware from his recent visit to Danoon that local residents there have asked whether or not RET would be applied to this particular service. Now it is in the CalMac portfolio. Can he provide Parliament with an update on that? Paul Wheelhouse. Um, in, indeed, that is an issue that has been raised. Uh, as the member may be aware, there was, um, for a period, a, a risk that there might be a judicial review of any decision to implement RET on the Guruk Danoon uh, route. But I am pleased to say that uh, indications from the private operator in the area Western Ferries is that they would not pursue that option and are keen to discuss with ministers uh, the implementation of RET on the Guruk Danoon services. And so we have indicated to, to local stakeholders, including the ferry group, that that is a discussion we wish to have. And certainly our intention is to, to take that forward positively. Rhoda Grant. Um, could um, the Scottish Government look at an indemnifying private operators who implement RET in the Northern Ireland Isles route uh, prior to receiving a reassurance from the Commission? This would allow the Scottish Government to implement RET sooner rather than later. Paul Wheelhouse. I, I, thank you, Presiding Officer. I haven't looked at that specific uh, proposal uh, before that Rhoda Grant raises. Um, however, we obviously have to tread very carefully. There is a live complaint and we are continuing to engage with the, com the Commission, obviously, to as early as possible resolution, as I said to, to Liam MacArthur. Clearly, we, I think, all have an interest in making sure that happens as soon as possible. And we have made a commitment to, to implement the policy uh, when we can do so. Uh, but I certainly have, haven't looked at the particular opportunity that Rhoda Grant raises. And I'll, I'll have a think about that and perhaps uh, write to Ms Grant uh, about that particular issue. Question number two, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the development of ferry vessels 801 and 802. Paul Wheelhouse. 
Uh, the delay to delivery remains a concern to Scottish ministers and we share the frustration of the communities affected and the workforce in the yard. The management of the contract is for uh, Ferguson Marine uh, Limited and uh, CMAL, however, Scottish Government officials have written again to FML this week suggesting or requesting information relating to vessels 801 and 802 to support a detailed programme with key milestones to support a revised cost to completion for both vessels. And in order to move matters on, Scottish Ministers have sought an independent view of the contractual dispute between FML and CMAL. Jamie Green. Uh, we learned this morning in the uh, Rural Economy Committee uh, that the first of the new ferries might be ready in about a year or so, more than two years behind schedule. The second ferry might be complete at some point next year. They both might be over budget to the tunes of tens of millions of pounds, and indeed the public purse might have to foot the bill. Isn't it simply the case, Minister, that your government might just have made a complete shambles of this? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, I think uh, Mr Green might want to reflect on the views I know that are held strongly in Inverclyde about his lack of support for the shipbuilding sector in Inverclyde. <laughs> this, 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 he, he may chunter from the sidelines, but this government has made a commitment to try and support shipbuilding jobs in, in the Clyde, and we're working very hard uh, to ensure those vessels are, are delivered. Uh, I would hope that Mr Green will reflect on the fact that there's as much as the government is doing, given the contractual nature of the dispute between Ferguson Marine and CMAL, we're trying to bring that uh, to a, a resolution as best we can. Clearly, we have had uh, revised timescales indicated by Ferguson's for delivery, which the member has alluded to, and I believe my colleague uh, Michael Matheson uh, discussed this morning with the committee. And we have sought, as I've said in my original answer, further detail to underpin those estimates, because we want to see detail about the, the work, work plan and indeed well, Mr Green can chunter from the sidelines. I'm trying to answer his question, and I would have thought he would want to listen to the answer. We are trying to make sure that we get the detail. Mr. Mr. Uh, Presiding Officer, Mr Green can continue to criticise, but the point is he's criticising his government. I would expect that Mr Green and other members would expect us to get the detail of the commitments from Ferguson Marine to deliver the vessels in terms of a revised work schedule and key milestones so we can manage that contract to completion. And to do anything else, I think, would be uh, a mistake. And I hope he reflects on the nature of his question today. I have three supplementaries that I would like to take. Can I ask for them to be quick, please? Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, notwithstanding the issues between CMAL and FMEL, uh, regarding uh, these vessels. Can the Minister confirm his support for the workforce at the yard yeah. who are attempting to, get sh to make sure that these two vessels are built and they will actually help the CML fleet? Paul Wheelhouse. Absolutely. The, the member who obviously represents in Reclaim uh, makes a very important point that whatever the issues that have arisen, um, there is a recognition that the quality of the workmanship at uh, Ferguson Marine and the standard of the, uh, the skills that are there are, are not in question and so um, I've, I've certainly CMAL have, have made very positive remarks around the, the, the workforce there that are at, at uh, Ferguson's and we clearly want to do all we can as I've said the, the actions of this government led by my colleague Derek Mackay have been to try and support the shipbuilding sector and ensure there's a long-term sustainable future for the workers in the yard and that's what we continue to try and focus our efforts on. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Given the impact of the dispute on, uh, on Ferguson's Marine uh, in particular uh, and the fact that the workforce do want to see this um, issue resolved uh, more than anywhere else, can the Minister tell us a bit more about what has been done to support the workforce specifically uh, and crucially to protect the long-term future of the yard and the vital jobs and skills that they deliver? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, clearly, I, I appreciate it's probably a matter of, of record now, the significant funding that the government has provided to ensure uh, it's worth stating that Ferguson's won the contract fair and square, but thereafter we've been trying to support the yard uh, to continue the work and to make sure that there's sufficient uh, resource there to, to see the contract through and support the workforce uh, during that period. Obviously, we continue to engage in terms of, as we, you would expect, uh, with the business in terms of all the support we can give to uh, investment in skills and to continue to, to look to uh, establishing a longer term pipeline, clearly for the whole shipbuilding sector in Scotland, uh, to ensure there's visibility of further work. And most latest uh, vessel, of course, that we're currently doing design for is the Isla vessel, and that will obviously be in due course an opportunity for Ferguson's other yards to tender for. So we're trying to make sure we do uh, a number of things across the spectrum, but I'm happy to meet with uh, Colin Smith uh, if he wishes to discuss this matter further. 
Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And will the Minister confirm that the Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to the completion and delivery of the Glen Sannox, 75% of which has already been outfitted to serve their Drossen to Brodick route, as well as boat 802. And I would say to the Minister that, unlike Mr Green, having asked the question, I will now listen to the answer rather than heckle it. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Wheelhouse. Th thank you very much um, uh, to, to Ken Kenneth Ferguson for the question. I mean, the contract, I want to, to use this opportunity to stress the contract for the vessels for CMAL is with uh, FMAL, uh, as the member has indicated. We are currently seeking details, as I said to Mr Green, on the programme to complete uh, the vessels. So I wouldn't want to comment on the exact percentage of the work that we understand has been completed at this time, but I, I note the, the figure that the member quotes. We obviously seek to have that confirmed and have further detail of the work that remains to be completed on 801 and obviously 802 as well. As we previously stated, we remain absolutely committed to the completion of these vessels, uh, to their deployment to serve the communities such as those in Arran and in North Ayrshire, uh, more generally, who, who are served by them, and to ensuring that we uh, rebuild uh, the future of shipbuilding at the site and make sure it continues for the long term. Question number three was not lodged. Question number four, Peter Chapman. Presiding officer, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review the signage for the AWPR. Michael Matheson. Uh, significant consultation was undertaken prior to designing the signage for this project. This resulted in a strategy which was agreed with local authorities during the design development stage. Prior to opening to traffic, all new sections of road undergo a safety audit, which includes a thorough review of signage. All signage is reviewed to ensure that it fully meets the required design and road safety standards. This audit confirmed that all signage is compliant with the appropriate standards and the aforementioned strategy. Consequently, no further changes are planned. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but disappointed with it because there, there has been a lit litany of issues with the management of the AWPR project and signage is one that is still causing problems. And I can give you the Cabinet Secretary three specific examples of where they fall down. Signs at the start of the AWPR at the Stonehaven end do not include major northeast towns like Fraserburgh and Peterhead. As a result, I have been contacted by local businesses in these areas as drivers heading to these towns who do not know the area do not take the AWPR and end up going through Aberdeen as a result. Secondly, the signage still does not show that tractors are banned, causing confusion and disruption to the local farming community. And thirdly, local businesses on the old routes have had their own signage removed because Transport Scotland does not, does not allow it, but refuses to work with them to find a compromise. So and it is clear the signage is not up to scratch. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to commit to working with North East Councils and communities and conduct a full, further review uh, of it. Excuse me, I'll decide when a question is taken too long. Would you like to finish, please, Mr Chapman, in silence? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. It is clear the Senate is not up to scratch. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to working with North East Councils and communities and conduct a review of it? Can we have a short answer, please, Cabinet Secretary? <laughs> there, there was a delay in the completion of this road. However, it took some 65 years for this government to actually make sure that it was delivered for the North East of uh, Scotland. What I can say to the member is that he is incorrect uh, because the audit uh, of the standards of the signage are correct. Uh, and the strategy for the signs uh, were actually agreed with the local authorities. Uh, and that's what has been complied with in the completion of the route itself. And in relation to some of the signs not being able to hold uh, local route information, part of that is because to do so would actually mean that there's too little room on the signs themselves uh, to actually carry the information which is uh, required. And I know that the member has raised the issue of tractors being allowed on this road on a number of occasions. But the orders to designate this road a special road were issued back in 2010. And therefore, it is a special road which is not allowed to be used for agricultural vehicles of the type that I know Mr Chapman is keen to see using the AWPR. But I'm afraid they are not allowed. Question number five, Mark Ruskell. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures... Sorry, Mr Ruskell, point of order, Mr Chapman. Just, oh, I've just realised I've, I've been speaking about tractors and I didn't de declare an interest as a farmer, so I need to do that now. 
I'm pretty sure most people would have guessed that you were a farmer. <laughs> Mr. Ruskell, question number Thank five. Thank you. If we can move on, move on from the tractors and start talking about aeroplanes. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that communities are protected from the effects of aircraft noise. Michael Matheson. I recognise the impact that noise from an airport can have on those affected. While airspace management is reserved to the UK Government under the Environmental Noise Scotland Regulations 2006, airports are required to produce noise action plans which set out the actions that the airport will take to mitigate the impact of its operations on local communities. An airport is required to use all reasonable endeavours to take action set out in their action plan and we would take action under the regulations if we thought that an airport was not doing so. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? I mean, he outlines the range of powers that airports have, particularly as competent authorities in relation to noise regulations. They also have very wide permitted development rights in planning, which often allows their unregulated, uncontrolled expansion. But does the Cabinet Secretary believe that in the case of Edinburgh Airport, the Minister should have more control over operating conditions through formal designation of the airport and then the use of powers under Section 78 of the Civil Aviation Act. Michael Matheson. Uh, officer, as I mentioned, in terms of the powers which we would use um, as Scottish Ministers, it would be under the Environmental Noise Scotland Regulations 2006, which impose a requirement for the airport to have uh, an action plan in place in relation to tackling noise and any uh, actions which were being taken uh, by Scottish ministers would be in relation to these particular uh, regulations and that's the approach which we uh, would take in relation to Edinburgh Airport. On the point he made in relation to permitted developments, he is correct to say that airport operators do have permitted development rights uh, within, the, uh, within the area of the designated airport. Um, development, permitted development rights um, are set out in secondary legislation under the existing planning powers, uh, and we have committed to reviewing permitted development rights following at the passing of the present planning bill before Parliament. Question number six was not lodged. Question number seven, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government how much it is invested in transport infrastructure in the North East in the last decade. Michael Matheson. In the last decade, the Scottish Government has invested in roads that benefit the North East, including the £745 million Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, uh, and the Balmide project, uh, the Inveramsey Bridge Improvement, and our planned duelling of the A96, which will see approximately 13, th sorry, £3 billion uh, invested in the duelling of the A96. We've also invested some £11 million in sustainable active travel and allocated some £7.8 million to North East Councils for cycling, walking and safer streets. We are funding the £330 million rail improvement project between Aberdeen and Inverness and Aberdeen and the Central Belt, which includes a new station at Lawrence Kirk. We are purchasing of four vessels operating uh, ferry services between Aberdeen and the Northern Isles and support of a further vessel and harbour improvements also totals some £59 million. And our annual support of £200 million to buses, including the National Concessionary Travel Scheme, brings significant benefit to the people of the North East of Scotland. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, well, Presiding Officer, I think that would, in any other context, be worthy of a round of applause. But uh, what we're seeing uh, from Aberdeen Constantine is that there's a substantial increase in the number of views that uh, potential customers are taking of houses to the south in Stonehaven and to the north of Aberdeen. And is this not a very serious early indication of the 16,000 new jobs that it's predicted the AWPR might bring to us and other benefits from that massive investment that's just been described? Michael Matheson. Epstein officer, all the early feedback on AWPR has been overwhelmingly positive, in particular those who recognise that it is transforming journey times in the northeast of Scotland, uh, including helping to improve and boost the northeast economy. Uh, and the type of feedback that the members just re referred to is an example of the economic benefits that are starting to be realised by the uh, Aberdeen Western uh, Peripheral Route. 
Uh, and officer, this is a demonstration of the Scottish Government's determination to make sure uh, that Scotland has a strong and robust economy, including in the north east of Scotland. And we will continue to invest in major infrastructure projects, not just in the north east of Scotland, but right across the country, to help to support our communities and to help to support the Scottish economy. I'm sorry there's no time for supplementaries. The afternoon's business is very packed. Question number eight was not lodged, and that concludes portfolio question times. We'll move on.